going on and what you're doing with the way that um, you're restructuring the, the work over at the Department of State. So can we start with that? And can you tell us what you guys are up to? Sure. Happy to. And if you don't mind, could I cover Absolutely. a couple of other things at the same time? Yep. Uh, Shane, I also want to thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. It's uh, the end of my fourth month on the job at the State Department. And uh, I know you've had an ab abiding uh, leadership role on internet governance issues over the years. So look forward to working with you. And I also want to thank the Internet Education Foundation and the Museum for hosting this event. And uh, so I want to thank all of you. As someone in government, you know, we really relish these opportunities that we can engage with a diverse set of stakeholders in one room at, at the same time. Um, as Shane said, my name is Rob Strayer. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cyber and International Communications and Information Policy at the State Department. That means that my office is the one at the State Department that leads our international diplomatic efforts, both on international telecommunications policy and on cybersecurity. Um, I'm privileged to join uh, Secretary Tillerson's team that is implementing the administration's agenda in the digital environment. There we are helping U.S. businesses, consumers, and Internet users advocate for their interests around the world. As you all know, the Internet has brought us tremendous economic growth and brought us new ways to share information. Businesses can share data across borders, making them much more efficient, bringing in new business opportunities, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. And we've also seen that individuals connect with each other in ways that they had not before. They're able to engage in debate in their countries and to shape their own future and affect the governance in their countries. So we've seen the Internet affect almost every aspect of our lives. And indeed, it's starting to affect almost every one of our economic and national security interests. And unlike other areas that have traditionally been in the domain in foreign policy that are exclusive to governments, that is, you can have just a government-to-government -government conversation about the issues, in the internet space, because so much of the infrastructure and the applications and the software are in the hands of the private sector, the private sector needs to be engaged. And it also involves so many of the interests that you all have in the room, uh, from civil society to the consumer base to um, other users advocating for human rights online. All those voices need to be heard in dealing with these difficult challenges that we have going forward. Uh, the State Department addresses those issues like they do any other international issue that's transnational, transborder, and, and truly international. That is, we seek to engage with countries and people around the world that share our interests. And with those shared interests, we seek outcomes that pursue our collective interests. Um, because we have worked together for so long in a multi-stakeholder environment, it's, we've sort of set the base. And I know that's the conversation, are we in a post uh, multi-stakeholder world. I don't think that we are. I think we're, we just need to keep fulfilling the same uh, set of stakeholder engagement that we've done for so long. There are a number of challenges, though, and the challenges seem to be growing. As we get more connected, of course, the threats that we face from cyber attacks continue to grow. We also are going to see increasing impacts of digital economic policies that can have unintended consequences to all of us, whether we're seeking to be consumers online, to engage in advocacy online, or to do business. Uh, digital economic policies have major ramifications for us. And we're starting to see the convergence of cybersecurity and the digital economy. And what do I mean by that? So in cybersecurity, the decisions and policies made by governments can have profound effects on the ability of those of us that seek to operate on the Internet. And with regard to the digital economy, internet, internet policy, telecom policy, privacy policy can help shape the cybersecurity landscape that exists now. And indeed, they set those technology decisions will set path dependencies going forward for what is available in our security interests down the road. Now, there's two particular uh, regulatory uh, issues that, uh, we, at a high level, we seek to advocate worldwide. One is not to fall into false dichotomies. Indeed, we can have security and privacy online without having total data localization. That is, we can still have active, robust, cross-border data flows without having to worry, with, and at the same time, have privacy of that data and ensure appropriate protections for the data, and as well have security from cyber threats. The second thing that we espouse when we talk to other governments is that we should not seek to have a centralized 
top-down control of the Internet. For the last few decades, the Internet has performed wonderfully from a bottom-up, multi-stakeholder approach to its governments. Gover governance. Essentially, we have allowed the engineers, the IEEE, ICANN, and others to be, have the leading role in making decisions about the future of the Internet. That shouldn't change going forward. But because, and because of that, uh, that bottom-up structure being so essential to the future of Internet governance, it's very important that we continue to follow a robust uh, dialogue with multiple stakeholders from the private sector to civil society to the consumer base. I'm, in fact, this evening I'm headed to Brussels to engage with the European Union on a range of issues, and those include their digital single market, privacy issues, and how we're going to cooperate in the International Telecommunication Union, which is a UN body that, while ostensibly was set up by a treaty and is intergovernmental, the ITU, it has had a growing number of multi-stakeholder voices injected into the conversation, and it's a key tenet of our engagement there that we need to keep having those private sector voices heard in ITU decision making. At the same time at the ITU, we're also very focused on ensuring that its mandate does not expand into areas that we know are better handled by private sector uh, uh, standard setting bodies and other ways of having engagement, such as at the Internet Governance Forum. So my message going forward to the folks we talk to around the world is that we should continue to keep an open and interoperable Internet to address our challenges, that we need to keep it as market-driven as possible, that we not limit opportunities for innovation by too quickly imposing government restrictions on how the Internet can continue to develop. And lastly, that we continue to ensure that we're hearing from a diverse set of multi-stakeholder voices. And with that, I thank you, and I look forward to the questions. Great. Thanks, Rob. And we wish you a lot of luck today. Um, uh, so uh, Larry Strickling was our most recent head of NTIA, and he went into multi-stakeholderism on, on both with two feet. Um, it was fantastic for those of us who had spent a lot of time with this just in the Internet governance space. Larry took it a little beyond that and tried to work through that model with other policy issues within the U.S. government, and then doing something that really no government people ever do. He has been working on a feasibility study. Um, which is, you know, something that would I, I'm very excited about. But um, Larry, tell us how you how how did that all work out, and 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 what do you think of multi-stakeholderism after living through it for multiple years? Um, well, well, first I want to jump in and say it's not an ism; um, <laughs> it's a process, and I think we don't do it any service by no referring isms. to okay. it as an ism. Um, in fact, I remember one of the very first speeches I gave on this years ago, I happened to say the word multi-stakeholderism, and I was roundly chastised by Milton Mueller afterwards for him telling me And, and it's so you not continued the favor. I got it. <laughs> so, um, so I'm passing that on, except I will point out that in the years that have intervened, I've heard Milton Mueller say multi-stakeholderism <laughs> many, many times. So... Um, um, but I think it's, it's, an, it's an important process that served the Internet well, and we don't have to go through all that. And I'm very heartened by the fact that already here, and we're only two hours into State of the Net, but we've already heard uh, the administrator of NTIA and we've heard Rob both reaffirm uh, this administration's commitment to a uh, multi-stakeholder approach to solving these policy issues. And I think <coughs> that, again, is very important in terms of ensuring the continuity of American support for this. Um, and it's something that's been bi bipartisan since the Internet was formed. And I think uh, that's an important thing that we see continue. Um, in terms of where it goes from here, um, these uh, uh, assumptions or concerns that somehow the multi-stakeholder approach is weakening or is not uh, no longer an adequate tool, I think, are, are clearly uh, off the mark. Uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity to continue to engage stakeholders in solving Internet issues, it, and it's something that um, I think has two arenas. I, Sally will talk very specifically about an initiative at the Internet Society uh, to get governments to utilize these tools more. So certainly that's one aspect of it, and that's something that at NTIA we worked on um, the last several years, and folks that have been part of that process are here in the room. I see Fiona and 
Jonah and Alan and others, and, and, I, and I hope that that all continues, and I have every reason to expect that it will. And that's, that's important as governments test how to do this. Um, but I also think there's a, a large gap out there in terms of the ability of stakeholders to come together on their own to solve these problems. I mean, we have seen, and, the, and history is replete with examples of waiting for governments to take action, and it doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, um, it solves a problem that doesn't exist any longer. Um, or for whatever reason, you end up with a, a case of regulatory capture where the outcome is not one that really serves the needs of stakeholders. And so what we've been looking at um, on behalf of the Internet Society is the, cap the possibility, the feasibility of organizing people to come together and solve problems. And the good news is that after um, months of interviews where we uh, around the world interviewed over 150 people, there's tremendous support for this, tremendous interest in, in finding a a way to uh, create a, a capability for bottoms-up, open, transparent, consensus-based decision-making, um, and, and, and then finding the right issues on which people can come together um, and try to solve some of these issues. And just the two points I want to emphasize about this that I hope will um, lead to the ultimate implementation of this and the success of it is, number one, there has to be a real focus on solving a real problem. In other words, the issue has to be defined in a way that the people who are in the room have it within their power and their capability to actually uh, form a solution, and then they have to implement it. I mean, I think what, if to the reason people may be frustrated with multi-stakeholder discussions um, is that too often they take the form of just another conference or an opportunity for people to share views, and that somehow you can check the box if what you've had is made sure you've had an engineer talk and an academic talk and somebody from civil society talk and somebody from business talk, okay, it's now multi-stakeholder. But if it doesn't lead to a consensus outcome that people have come together to work to build and then commit to implement, then I think for the most part um, it's an interesting conversation, but um, it, we really aren't advancing the ball. And if we really want to, to impress upon people the importance of continuing the multi-stakeholder approach, there will have to be a discipline of people coming together to actually commit to working on an issue and committing to implementing it. Um, I think if we do that, we will see the legitimacy of these processes continue to grow and expand. Um, and I think an, uh, as providing guidance then to what may end up being ultimate government intervention down the line will provide important guidelines, important precedent, important norms that can be utilized if a more universal and forcible solution needs to be implemented by governments. Great. Thanks, Lori. Jovan, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, so obviously we are sitting in Washington, D.C., and we tend to be a little myopic and centered in our, our U.S. Um, perspective on this. Talk about the work that you've been doing with uh, Eurodig. And I mean, you guys have a, a very extensive group of um, collaborative efforts that you put together. I would recommend anybody who's not familiar with the work that Jovan, Jovan and his group do to look at his website because it's it really goes well beyond some of the main issues that we do in internet governance. But it, And one of the things you talked about in our prep session was um, the, the importance of doing this because otherwise a lot of these things may go to a, um, a judicial area or to the courts. So can you expand on that? Sure, Shane. Uh, thank you. Well, yesterday when I was um, arriving to um, DC, I, um, first I noticed that we have more or less the same weather like in Geneva. <laughs> it's cloudy, <laughs> rainy. And I was, I was thinking, well, uh, what, what could be a message? And thank you for adopting me to in this panel, which is mainly U.S. Uh, US uh, uh, populated. And uh, the, one of the questions was that um, it reminded me of one saying of uh, Metternich, who at one point said uh, when uh, at the Napoleonic time, when uh, France uh, uh, sneezes, Europe uh, uh, catches the cold. <laughs> and I think it's definitely clear when Washington or, or the US sneezes in digital world, uh, it affects the rest of the world. This is the first point, and I guess that these discussions at the, at the, this conference has been to the large extent framed realistically around this development. What is the new development? And on this flight from Frankfurt to Washington, uh, it was you, you have eight, nine hours to reflect, was that uh, what is happening outside the United States is increasingly influencing uh, economy, security, and other digital developments in the United States. Uh, there are many examples. Uh, uh, um, uh, Rob mentioned the GDPR. It has been featured in the first session. 
25th of May will be important day for the future of digital uh, world. We don't know in what direction it will move. There is a Chinese cybersecurity law. And there is one development which is really important. This is the in, uh, increasing role of the courts and juridical authorities all over the world. We, in involved in digital policies, may organize, establish next working group, expert group, and continue discussing, as unfortunately is happening in some bodies, like uh, these days at the working group on enhanced cooperation in Geneva. But uh, once the citizens comes to the court and ask to, uh, for his rights to be protected, court has to rule on the specific requirement. And this is happening in the European Court of Justice, it's happening in Canada, United States, and worldwide. Therefore, that gap that was created without proactive uh, digital policy, I would say, or coordinated digital policy, is increasingly filled by national courts. Now, uh, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, and uh, coming from that professional background, I know that uh, there is a limited uh, uh, view and limited perception for digital policy. And we will get through that rulings, as we got with the right to be forgotten, and to some extent with Uber uh, ruling, we'll get uh, a really uh, limited and not optimal digital policy. This is going to be a huge challenge ahead of us. Now, some good news uh, on... Uh, on this, well, the weather could be, digital weather could be described with the current weather in the DC and uh, Geneva with the uh, quite cloudy, unsettled, uh, <laughs> but there are uh, some um, uh, sunny spells. And uh, I think the major development where we should look for the optimistic uh, um, uh, scenarios is that we, in a way, stopped sleepwalking over the last 12 months in digital policy. For a long time, we got used to the fact that technology will, by itself, solve the problems, uh, bring ultimately happier and more, uh, more prosperous society. We started facing insecurity, as, uh, as you indicated, in other fields. We started facing problems. Therefore, we are stopping this sleep, uh, sleepwalking in different ways. From Mark Zuckerberg, I'm sure, having the sleepless nights trying to fix the Facebook these days, to governments, governments worldwide. It is good. Therefore, the real uh, politic is entering the digital politics. and. Uh, Companies, governments, citizens are looking to the sort of bottom line in different different ways. This is the first point. Second uh, point is that uh, we have variable geometry. United States and Russia, for example, disagreed on the question of cybersecurity in the UNGG, but they were on the same line at the WTO negotiation on digital commerce. They are part of this plurilateral movement. We'll be seeing more and more, and China is quite close to accept WTO negotiations on the digital commerce. We'll be seeing more and more this variable geometry, which is good for the, some sort of global compromise on, on, in digital policy. The next point is that we need uh, really, really, but I call it genuine transparency. Uh, that's a real requirement in digital policy. When I in add this genuine transparency, which is a bit uh, oxymoron because transparency should be transparent, so otherwise it's translucency or uh, <laughs> opacity. <laughs> okay. uh, the point is that uh, we have to be transparent, not only in bringing cameras in the conference room, but also in understanding the level of cybersecurity risks, understanding the, the uh, digital uh, commerce, the question of taxation and, and other issues that affect people worldwide. This is the first point, which brings me some hope that multi-stakeholderism will have a future, not necessarily based on the previous more ideological approach, but uh, a real political approach. And another reason is that there is a huge interdependence. Uh, I was recently in the Balkans, in one country, addressing the government officials, and I, when we discussed what would they dis ask me, what would have happened if the Facebook is access to Facebook is cut. I said, you will have within three or four hours 100,000 people in the square in front of the government. This is a huge interdependence. <laughs> and in the same time, Facebook, as we can see with the Google and other companies, Uber, also depends on government decisions. Therefore, that inter interdependence which exists between different players is a good basis to bring all of these players around the, around the same table and discuss some sort of global social contract or uh, or international social contract, not necessarily as a treaty, not as a certain document signed on dotted lines, I'm sorry, but understanding on the future of, of digital policy. This is the, the, the another important, uh, important point. And all in all, uh, we have to, uh, the one real challenge will be that we cannot anymore uh, follow the approach which served us well last 10 years. 
which is an approach of sort of inertia and uh, waiting to problems that uh, would be solved by themselves. It served as well. Internet experienced enormous growth. The problems that we face uh, currently uh, will require some sort of precautionary approach. We cannot have any more wait and see approach. And here will be the major challenge on our multi-stakeholder approach, how to make it uh, effective, uh, addressing the issue which is completely unpredictable, which is difficult to envisage how it will develop, and to make some sort of balance, and balance is the keyword, between uh, ensuring the public interest, interest of uh, countries worldwide and citizens, while uh, uh, also opening possibility for future growth and development and not suffocating innovative aspect of the digital industry. That balance will be crucial for digital diplomats, policy makers, uh, company representatives, and all others involved in, the, in this, this process. Thank you. you. Gave us a lot to think about there. So, um, Sally, we were on our prep call for this, and, and it, for those of you who engage in this issue, you know there's a lot of dancing around on whether some countries engage in the multi-stakeholder process. And I thought I heard Sally say they need to stop dating and commit. And I was like, wait, did she? Did she? Oh, she said debating. But I liked <laughs> I liked dating better because I thought it made you know it was kind of it had especially when you're you know she's like the, about the model, it just everything about it. So, um, <laughs> so Sally kind of put that thought in my head. And and with that, I know that one of the concerns you have is is how much we have um, you know states actually committing to the multi-stakeholder process and what that means for the internet society. Sure. Thanks, Shane, and uh, thanks to State of the Net for um, inviting me and for hosting um, this panel. Uh, you, many of you may know, li late last year, the Internet Society released a report on uh, looking into the future of the Internet, which is always a dangerous pro proposition. But uh, the thinking behind that was that we wanted to talk to as many people in our global community about what they see on the horizon. And we're not trying to go 20, 30 years out, but we were a little bit more uh, practical in looking five, maybe 10 years out. What are the opportunities? What are the fears? What are the um, hopes that they, that they see for the internet? And one of the things that really came through to us was this growing sense that this idea of a user-centric internet, this idea that the user was going to be at the core of the internet's development, of its policy, of its innovation, is being lost. And that that is not necessarily the future that many people see for the internet. And the drivers behind that were of interest. Um, they see, uh, we were hearing an internet dominated by um, commercial interests, an internet where um, the, the big players um, dominate and the users are sort of coming along and, and using services for which they have uh, little control of their information, their experience, um, et cetera. Uh, the notion that the government was um, intervening in ways that were both known and unknown, and that that was having huge implications for um, the end users that they didn't even understand, but they were worried. They were worried that the security discussion is going to have um, deep, deep impacts on their uh, ability um, for free expression that um, the internet shutdowns that people are experiencing all over the world are only on the rise, and that that is a trend that people see, um, that they don't believe that it will abate. Uh, the notion that government is using the internet to, as, a, as a tool for geopolitics, for warfare, for surveillance of their people, this came through all over the world. And then finally, this sense that, you know, as we all feel, that, that, that crime, that criminal activity, hacking, DDoS attacks, et cetera, is both shaking the infrastructure of the internet at huge levels, which a lot of the engineers and the companies are seeing daily, as well as impacts, obviously, on the end user that they don't begin to understand. So these are big and, and really sort of disturbing trends that, that we were um, hearing about. But people's confidence in the sort of evolution of the internet in the opportunities that the internet brings is not, has not diminished. And particularly as we heard from people in developing countries that said, this is our future, this is our life, we want a voice in this, we expect to have a seat at the table, and we, we don't believe that's going to go away and we're going to keep fighting for it. So that was, you know, on the, on the good news side. 
So as we were looking at all of these views at the Internet Society and thinking, okay, what is the next step? There is this sense that, you know, in the world that the multi-stakeholder, you know, game has run its course 10, 15 years, people debated it. And that was nice, but now we have big issues to deal with. So thank you very much, Internet governance. We're going to go deal with security now or regulation or whatever. And we're not at the Internet Society ready to accept that. We believe that the model, the approaches that multi-stakeholder governance bring to the Internet and beyond the Internet space, it's not just in the Internet, are still valid and still necessary if we want the kind of Internet where users are at the center, which we do. Um, and so, as you know, Larry pointed out, we are looking at how do we, as communities, come together and set up processes ourselves that aren't dictated by the government or anyone else to solve some of these issues that really do exist that could benefit from a lot of stakeholders coming to the table and putting their heads together in solutions that can be implemented. In addition to that, at the Internet Society, we think it's uh, well past time for governments to actually start implementing these processes at home. It's all well and good to go to lots of international meetings and get references to multi-stakeholder governance and as many resolutions as possible and statements and this and that, but it's time to start doing this at home. Um, and a number of countries have done that. Um, as uh, Larry Strickling pointed out, the U.S. government um, started a number of these endeavors um, over at NTIA. Um, up in Canada right now, there's a process underway uh, where they've set up a multi-stakeholder committee to develop the IoT security approaches for Canada. Uh, we are seeing the African Union come forward and say, all right, we need a multi-stakeholder um, process in our own region to deal with cybersecurity. Uh, so there are these things, they're nascent, they're starting to emerge, and we at the Internet Society want to see if we can put our shoulder behind some of those things and, and really take it from statements in a resolution to actual implementation. Because again, the issues are real and it's, it's time to start making these processes do more than be the source of endless discussions in the UN and elsewhere and really be implemented. That was the whole point uh, of all of this. So that's where we're coming from this year and that's gonna be, I think, one of the big um, areas of focus for, for our work. Great, thanks, Sally. So if, if Larry was definitely cheerleading the process and making sure that all the multi-stakeholders were in the room, there was not one person who was in more rooms being a multi-stakeholder <laughs> than Steve Del Bianco. Somehow he was in like an Indianapolis and Brussels that felt like always at the same time. So, um, and you were very engaged in the, um, in the, the multiple processes that were going on, specifically at ICANN, but in internet governance. So can you expand on that as our best multi-stakeholder person at the table? Yeah, thanks, Shane. Welcome, believers! Because <laughs> you must be a believer if you came to a panel that was called uh, Are We in a Post-Multi-Stakeholder World? And uh, many had their conversion moment for multi-stakeholder through the transition from ICANN uh, with U.S. oversight to ICANN more of a global oversight. But I, I'll just ask the question, was that transition really a multi-stakeholder experience? Because it didn't really start that way. The transition started because the Obama administration made the decision, unilateral decision, top-down decision, to go ahead and transition the U.S.'s remaining direct oversight role. But thankfully, Larry Strickling implemented that decision in a multi-stakeholder process and demanded that multi-stakeholder processes be used as the community determined how to step into the U.S.'s shoes. And that process worked partly because it motivated compromise on the part of a lot of parties that wouldn't have, wouldn't have compromised. And motivated compromise because there was a target date, a deadline, which was the end of the Obama administration. I, I guess we learned through the election how important that deadline really was. And uh, let's think about a process that's underway right now, also involving ICANN. Uh, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, was mentioned prominently by David Reddle this morning. And those privacy rules have been around for a long time. All that's really new is it becomes law in May. The GDPR runs headlong into ICANN's implementation of who is. David mentioned that too. And if any of you are unfamiliar with who is, go to um, whois.icann.org, type in a domain name, and ICANN will tell you who runs it today. There's tremendous tension amongst all these players. 
law enforcement, his intention even with the data protection authorities and some governments, the business community and civil society in a real tension over what and how information is revealed when people own a domain name. So GDPR, May of 2018, should have been a huge driver for consensus for the decades-long policy development we've done at ICANN over who is. So it wasn't. The status quo, it turned out, which was the way ICANN has run who is since day one, was largely satisfactory to law enforcement and the business community. So since it was satisfactory, why change it? Uh, that's the issue, too, that if people are satisfied with the status quo, they won't move to compromise. But now we are three months from the deadline, three months from the implementation where there will be huge fines based on a company's global revenue. So it turns out that today, 29th of January, ICANN is closing off comments and will take the next two weeks to do a decision, a top-down decision, on how ICANN will do the interim compliance. They call it the interim model. So there's nothing really multi-stakeholder about that either. It's just a consultation by ICANN. And uh, the truth is, though, as ICANN's interim compliance kicks in, all of us around the world are going to live with that through the periods between now and even post-implementation of GDPR. And as we live with that interim compliance, it's, a, it's going to give a lot of us stakeholders an opportunity to decide whether we like that new status quo. And I'm betting that most everybody, civil society, won't like certain aspects of this interim compliance. I'm betting the business community and law enforcement won't find it nearly open enough to be able to learn who's running a domain name. And I'm, I'm even confident the contract parties that I can are not going to be too happy about it. Well, that alone could give rise to what the impetus to compromise on a long-running process at ICANN where we were trying to develop a replacement for the who is. And it, I hope that this time next year that we've made progress because not everybody's happy with the status quo. So I don't think we're in a post-multi-stakeholder post world. And I think it's going to be with us a while longer. And uh, who is and GDPR are going to be part of the reason. So you bring up an interesting point. Um, uh, do we need there to be an almost crisis situation for the multi-stakeholders to want to get into a room? Um, you know, you've mentioned several times that there was about ready to be a pending government action. And Jovan mentioned the idea that we need to be doing this more from a precautionary, you know, idea of getting ahead of the process. So do, do we, I mean, is there, if you're wanting to get a multi-stakeholder group together, and, and cyber is definitely an interesting space there that, you know, do you have to pick a topic that's about ready to implode to get people to be a multi-stakeholder process? Shane, I, I might suggest, I mean, and Larry's paper done with ISOC is excellent at describing the pressure of having an important issue and a deadline. But sometimes the deadline can be, can be manufactured. It could be something, an offer that expires at a, at a certain date, right? It could be a notion that if you don't act by such a date, well, then we are going to implement the following policy and you'll have to live with it. But that isn't the end of the game, because if the policy that gets implemented makes enough people uncomfortable, then there's the motivation to fix it. I'll, I'll address your question, Shane. I think that um, the kinds of processes we're talking about, we're, really, we're talking about things that are voluntary. So the question is, what gets people into the room? So yes, a crisis, um, worrying about an alternative outcome might bring people into the room. Steve talks about the importance of deadlines. I'd say not one, none of them is, is absolutely required. Um, but you have to have an issue on which people are willing to say, this is an important issue to me. It's important to my company or my organization. And I'm willing to put in the time to come to a consensus outcome that can then be implemented to help solve the problem. And so when you're talking about doing all this in a voluntary setting, you have to understand what are the motivations that bring those people together. Quite honestly, if you wait and take on an issue too late into its life cycle, there's probably little a multi-stakeholder discussion can do with it. So like take net neutrality. It might have been possible to have done a multi-stakeholder um, process on net neutrality maybe 10 years ago, but I don't think you could possibly do one today because it's now um, evolved into what is really a theological debate much more than a technical debate. And I think the party lines are so well drawn that the idea that you could get people to now reach consensus on that is is pretty slim. Um, but nonetheless, it has to be an issue that is important enough and has emerged far enough that people even understand what the implications are. Because if you were 
were to take a totally new issue and try to bring people together to talk about it and solve it, they may not even have enough experience with it to understand what the issues are they need to be resolving. So there's kind of a sweet spot um, that I've believed existed, which is that the issues out there, it's important. People recognize it has implications for their um, themselves and their organizations. And it's now gotten to a point where people are saying, you know what, it'd be great if there were a way to come together with other folks and try to solve it. And that's the role that, um, you know, our feasibility study lays out, which is creating that kind of capability to help identify and encourage people to come together and solve those issues. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the um, deadlines are always useful and good, especially if when you deal with such a messy policy issues as digital policy issues are. I mean, you can write many doctoral theses, have prolonged discussions, conferences, but at some point, one has to decide and to, to draw the line and to make it good enough. Now, one uh, sort of uh, sword that exists in the digital policy community are the course decisions. And those decisions, they are not related to the concrete deadline, but they are gradually imposing digital policy. Now, the problem is that there is no pressure of deadline while there are the new dynamics and new reality which is created. Right to be forgotten is replicated in quite a few countries worldwide. Uh, it made the Google almost the, ju the biggest juridical institutions globally without their intentions. Uh, Uber uh, business model is now under the challenge in, the, in Europe. And what is happening very often, other countries are then seeing uh, following the Europe uh, because Europe has, a, in a way, institutional power to challenge the Internet companies. Therefore, you will be having the course decisions uh, de facto reshaping global digital policy. And this is an uh, urgency which is not related to deadline, but it, it, it will be happening uh, more and more. Sal, you touched on this a little bit. I'm thinking trying to get away from the ICANN dialogue, but like Internet of Things, and I realize everybody's got a little bit of a foot in the game here. The ITU is looking at uh, the um, digital object architecture as a way to, to deal with that. Um, you mentioned the um, African Union is looking at a way to handle cyber cybersecurity, and obviously, uh, Rob, you're going to have many di dialogues and discussions about where do we get to decide hard stop, this is how we manage these things, or when do we let uh, you know consumers decide how much risk are they willing to take on. So thoughts about that, and kind of use IoT as a bank shot against that? Yeah, I think um, there's obviously, as you said, there's a lot of players in the IoT space. And um, it is interesting that when you, at least when we have been speaking to governments, it's one of those areas that they they realize fundamentally that, that yes, you can issue a policy on it, but it's it's affecting almost every sector of their economy, right? And, and the policy, a, a blanket policy approach is not likely to be successful when you're trying to translate from the healthcare industry over to the transportation industry and, and uh, biotech and, and on you go. So that, that brings, a, I think, maybe an openness to the discussion. Having said that, I mean, what we're talking about in IoT is an enormous explosion of, of the threat vectors, right, that we're looking at. And I think governments are rightly concerned about that, and they're trying to figure out how do we navigate that space. At the same time, governments are going to be enormous users of the technology. And so it's not just a conversation about procurement, but it's about what is the data that they are going to be collecting via all of these devices and using to then formulate government policy, and how is that being uh, monitored and evaluated, and how is all of our data individually as, as, as end users being swept up in all of that? We are the source of that information. We are the source of those policies. And we don't really, as end users, have a sense of um, what that all means for us. I, it's a growing industry. It's a very, I mean, in some ways we're at the cusp of it. In some ways we're, you know, right in the middle of it. Um, for us at the Internet Society, it is absolutely crucial that these trust and security issues related to IoT get addressed um, in a cohesive fashion, in a way that is that brings in a lot of different sectors of the economy, sectors that haven't been part of the Internet security discussion to date, necessarily. So it's a whole new set of stakeholders being brought in and be done in a way that ultimately users understand what's going on, and they don't today. So this is not going to be something easily solved by a government fiat, for example. And um, it's going to have to be something that is that we all, um, as users, as um, a society, come to grips with and pretty, pretty quickly. 
I agree 100 percent that you need to think about the full diverse array of stakeholders that have, have equities involved and from the manufacturers to the governments to the users uh, as we think about how we're going to move forward with IoT. We've heard countries talk about, in, for example, in the EU, from a voluntary system of certification labeling to other countries. Uh, looking at the China cyberspace law, you could see their network product and services definition potentially include IoT, and that would require potentially very onerous requirements to have your uh, technology certified to a certain standard and have even share source code in some cases. And other countries, maybe like India, that are still in this interim stage of thinking about how they want to move forward, potentially with their own certification regime. One thing I think that uh, hopefully all these countries think about and we talk to them about is we certainly don't want to put in a balkanized system where if you're selling, seeking to sell a product around the world, that you have to meet varying certification standards in different markets. It'll make it harder and more expensive for your consumers within your jurisdiction to, uh, to acquire those products. Um, NIST has had a very thoughtful proposal pursuant to the uh, May uh, cyber executive order that they produced that talks about ways we can think about configuration of these devices, ways that we should be working with international standard setting bodies so that we're ensuring that we're getting to a market driven approach that is led by industry and includes uh, multiple voices uh, from the multi-stakeholder base uh, in thinking about what kind of standards we're going to need going forward. So. My, my caution would be that folks shouldn't rush too quickly to uh, address uh, IoT without thinking about the uh, sort of unintended effects, what it could mean for costs on consumers, and that we also shouldn't treat every IoT device as providing the same vulnerability or same risk. We should think about the type of data that that device can touch and well, what it can touch. You know, what kind of, is that sensitive personal information? Is that healthcare information? Is it something that's just purely industrial that we would have less concerns about? So I think thinking about a nuanced approach that's carefully thought out through multi-stakeholders the way we should move forward. So multi-stakeholder becomes multidisciplinary-ism. Um, we're going to open it to the audience. I don't know if we have microphones in the room. Do we, Gary? Okay. So we've got a couple of microphones coming from the back. Questions for the panel? <coughs> They've explained it all. <laughs> well, that was easy. One. All right, we've got one in the back here. Hi, um, Ashley Gold with Politico. Uh, wondering what Mr. Strickling thinks of reports that uh, the Trump administration might want to nationalize um, a 5G network. <laughs> He's looking to make news on this, I can tell. Gee, that wasn't the question I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I figured somebody you, you, would want to ask about re undoing IANA. Um, <laughs> These are your choices, Larry. I, my choices. Um, I, I, I just saw the, a brief clip of this on Axios, so I really don't know exactly what's being proposed, and uh, so I would hesitate to uh, comment on it, although it sounds like an intern project. Yeah. <laughs> All, all of the stakeholders in, in that particular crazy question, the, the operators, citizens, civil society, government, all those stakeholders would make a tremendous amount of noise on what kind of a plan could be done to so-called nationalize 5G broadband. But, but we don't really practice the process of multi-stakeholder consensus building. We practice the process of multi-stakeholder noise making, but ultimately, run to one authority in Congress or the administration to make a decision. And that's not multi-stakeholder process. Way to stay on topic, Steve Del Bianco. Okay. <laughs> Next question that's not about 5G. There's another panel, by the way, on 5G at 2.30 today. So Ashley, was it? I hope we will hear you ask that question back then, too. Okay, we got one in the middle of the room. Hi. You got, you got right, Gary's, Shel right? Got it. Shelly Sandoval from UDC. Um, I wanted to also uh, touch on IoT, and um, I saw a recent Brookings session with AT&T and IBM and some fellows from DC, um, and I was just wondering if you can talk about IoT and the importance of research institutions or how, what are the needs that you guys want researched? Well, I'm going to open that to the panel. They're, small, they're all smart people. It's a little off topic, but it seems to be the theme of asking questions. <laughs> right. um, sure, we'll try. Uh, there's obviously a, a lot of research that could be done. I think one of the areas that Internet Society is interested in right now is, um, and I don't know if this is purely a, really a research topic, but how do you get consumers to value security sufficiently to demand it? 
uh, in an IoT environment, when the cost of, when, when the price competition is so fierce, the cost of additional security is, can be a disincentive for device manufacturers. And again, as I said, you have device manufacturers that haven't traditionally been in the internet space now playing in the internet space. Their devices are connected to this network of networks. So their, their device suddenly has global implications if it, if it is not secured properly. Um, all of that matters and should matter to end users. Again, the data that's being collected about you, how is it being stored, what third parties have access to it, is the data being collected absolutely necessary? We've all gotten those, those notifications on your smartphone saying, you know, so-and-so wants access to your contacts. My, my alarm on my phone to wake me up in the morning thinks it needs access to my contacts. Why is that? Okay, but multiply that into a device environment. Um, how do you get consumers to care about that? There are groups, Consumer Reports is trying very hard, Mozilla is trying very hard right now to figure out how do you, how do you make uh, consumers willing to, to demand and then willing to pay for a security that's really in all of our interests. I think that would be a, it's an interesting research question mm -hmm. and it's an interesting one that needs not 10 years of research but maybe <laughs> a short term project. All right, we're gonna go to Steve and then Jovan. Shelley, one way that the research community can contribute immediately is to think about proposing standards or best practices. And, and Larry convened several of these at NTIA still in the, going. and still going on, right, because proposing a set of standards, let me give you two examples, technical interoperability among IoT devices coupled with practices with regard to the collection and sharing of private information. Just laying down markers on what kind of protocols and standards you could propose will cause multi-stakeholders to convene, to come together and address whether those are the appropriate standards. As Larry said earlier, though, it's important to have a, a path forward so that any such standards would be actually adopted and implemented by industry groups or companies themselves. Otherwise, there isn't the real importance attached to it. Great, thanks. Jovan? One uh, research, I think very important research, uh, should be on the impact of IOTs on uh, externalities in the, in the economic context, because they will be creating externalities that somebody has to cover. When it comes to the oil drilling, uh, now governments are uh, covering basically an environmental cost of the 50 or 60 or 100 years of the, of the environmental damage. Uh, uh, those IOT services which create vulnerabilities will create externalities. And we're seeing the, some companies already, I always argue that Microsoft proposal for Digital Geneva Convention is to the large extent uh, inspired by Microsoft trying to share these externalities, which are in the budget almost 1.5 billion US dollars, their cost on cybersecurity with governments. And this issue will be in the focus of the economic research. The question of IOTs and uh, security risk and externalities and who is going to cover those externalities, companies? Maybe governments, citizens, users, maybe those who benefit through artificial intelligence. As we know, IoT we generate a lot of data, which is used for AI. Maybe that could be shared, but that is going to be the major issue, which is to some extent behind the Microsoft proposal on the Digital Geneva Convention. Another question in the back. Wait, do I, I don't think it's on. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you. My name is John Holmblad, and I work in the U.S. Senate in cybersecurity. Uh, but my question is really, what is the um, current administration's perspective regarding whether or not the ITU can play a constructive role in Internet governance going forward, say, over the next decade? Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on that? And then really to all the panel members, but in particular it's to those that you, are in though. government. <laughs> well, thanks for the question. Um, it's complicated. It would be the, the short answer to my longer answer you're going to get, which is that, you know, the ITU was started in 1865 to help, you know, set up standards for the telegraph. So, and one of the key roles it's played in the last century was helping us sync up our telecommunications uh, phone lines, the exchange, the settlement, the, the billing that went along with that, phone controlling numbers, 
and also uh, harmonizing spectrum across borders. So those key aspects, of, if you will, of the infrastructure layer of the internet is where the ITU has been the most successful in seeing worldwide adoption and uh, providing, uh, providing for opportunities to ensure that the internet would blossom based on that underlying infrastructure. Um, in our view, the ITU should not be involved in thinking about things that ride more on the application layer of that. So uh, we, we, we seek in our involvement at the ITU to ensure that uh, the ITU's mandate states to that more narrow base of spectrum and uh, underlying infrastructure policy. At the um, IGF meeting, there was, a I think, an IETF engineer stood up and said, you know, because your Wi-Fi works the same all around the world is kind of the one example that people really understand, you know, that was a, a, came out of an ITU discussion. All right, we have time for one last question. Oh, Steve, did you want to add to that? Now, on the ITU, since we're talking about multi-stakeholder, it's good to know what is and what isn't. And the ITU, like the United Nations, is a place where only governments get a vote. And by the way, every government always gets one vote. So countries that don't care about something might trade other things they care about to get those votes. Business and civil society can make noise on the sidelines, but there's nothing about the UN and ITU that's remotely multi-stakeholder. So there's an automatic disinclination on, on the part of Rob and the, any administration to see things that ought to be multi-stakeholder somehow taken over by the ITU. All right, other, all right last question in the middle of the room here. Hi, um, I'm Alan McQuinn with ITIF. I, Welcome. Uh, so I can trans transitioned over a year and a half ago, or roughly a year and a half ago. And um, before they transitioned, there was a lot of changes made with accountability and um, transparency. I was wondering if a year and a half in, if y'all could talk about how ICANN is doing with its uh, dependence. Dependence. Uh, interdependence, sorry. Like, how is it doing um, in regard to how uh, if influence from governments and, and such? Alan, hey, it's uh, Steve Del Bianco. Thanks for the question. ICANN had been a multi-stakeholder organization and still is. What we changed, Alan, was to make the entity called the board more accountable to the actual community it serves. I'm, I'm happy to report that the board is, is newly and keenly attentive to the interests of the community and operating within the new bylaws, whether it's the reviews, the budgets, and uh, the, the other challenges that ICANN faces. So I would say that ICANN is an improved organization as a result of the transition, but we haven't had that existential crisis yet that would truly put to a test whether we've dramatically improved the accountability to that point. The, the GDPR is an example that we're stepping into now, and we'll have a chance to see the degree to which the transition improvements are going to pay dividends for everyone. And to the extent you were asking specifically about the possibilities of government capture, um, that was never a realistic issue. Um, the actions taken in the transition plan make it an even more remote possibility, which is it's not going to happen. Um, and I think the last year and a half has again demonstrated that um, ICANN's process in terms of taking government opinion into account um, is set up well and, and works well and does not in any way raise the possibility of government capture. Anyone else on ICANN's? year and a half of independence. <laughs> All right, well, uh, join me in thanking our panel. We will have one more speaker downstairs and then we'll break for lunch at 1230. So thank you very much for joining us today. I think good lads up. Good lads in front of lunch. Yeah. Yeah.